yes yes here you are sir. welcome welcome sumit good, good good morning sir good morning and thank you for joining in and uh, thank you everybody for joining in this webinar on competition law uh, competition laws in india practical implications on corporates i am sumit pawa uh, i am a lawyer and company secretary with 24 years of experience and currently the co-founder and ceo of complinity technologies complinity is India's leading compliance software, uh, taking care of uh, all the laws in the country, helping companies companies comply with all the laws in the country. We cover over 2,000 laws, 25,000 compliances, including corporate laws, tax laws, labor laws, environmental laws, and even competition laws. Uh, today, we have uh, an eminent speaker, Mr. M.M. M. Sharma, uh, with us. Mr. M.M. M. Sharma uh, is an advocate, uh, practices in Delhi High Court. Uh, heads the Competition Law and Policy Practice of Welsh Associates Advocates since 2009. Mr. Sharma has over 30 years of experience, including judicial experience as a judge advocate in the Indian Navy for over 10 years. He holds a PG Diploma in Economics in Competition Law from King's College, London. He's also worked in the Competition Commission of India as Registrar during 2006 to 2008, during its formative phase, and then in the Jindal Steel and Power and as Head Legal. Uh, Mr. Sharma is a thought leader and a regular columnist in leading dailies like Economic Times, Financial Express on competition laws. Uh, uh, much more can be spoken about him, but uh, uh, more importantly, at a personal level, uh, what I would like to really say today and, and, uh, and really express my gratitude towards Mr. Sharma, uh, there was a minor incident where at his morning walk, he actually fell down today. And uh, therefore, he had to go to the doctor and, and several other things. But uh, thanks to him, uh, thanks, Mr. Sharma, that you still sort of made it uh, to this webinar, keeping your commitment to, to our hundreds of uh, uh, people who registered today to hear you. So thank you very much, sir, for sort of coming in and gracing this webinar today. Thank you. Thank you, Sumit. Uh, thanks for my introduction. <clears throat> sure, sir. I and I would be a little slow because of the, you can see the pain, which I'm slightly having, though I've taken a combi flam in the morning. <laughs> so you can see that my face is still swollen. Yeah, yeah, I, I, can, see the bruises, I can see the bruise on your left cheek. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I have applied betadine on this. Anyway, yeah, so yeah. we being in the services, we are taught to be slightly fitter than other, more other civilians. So I thought I would not miss my commitment. Sure, Thank so you very really, much for really, really, giving me really, this yeah. honor deep level of gratitude uh, from my side and on behalf of all the participants that you're joining today, despite this. So, okay, introducing the topic, uh, competition law, we all would have heard about the competition law. Uh, the purpose of the Competition Act is to prevent unfair trade practices. Uh, some of the old hands would know. In fact, when I qualified my company secretary in, in the year 2000, uh, there used to be MRTP Act. Some of you may have heard that Monopolistic and Restrictive Trade Practices Act. And I passed my CS reading the MRTP Act. And the, and the moment I passed, uh, the law got repealed and it got replaced with Competition Act. Uh, no other uh, sort of teacher taught me after, after I qualified. But today we all have the privilege of Mr. Sharma with us. Uh, this act is, uh, you know, if you go through the act, it's a very strange act, unlike so many other acts, where there are very detailed substantive provisions, either in company law or income tax or so many other acts. There are very detailed substantive provisions. But here, uh, you know, as a lawyer, I, I may, if I may say, there are only three, four sections, key substantive sections, section three, section four, section five, and everything else is mostly procedural, administrative about the commission, the powers, et cetera, et cetera. But, but still, so much is left to the decided case laws, the, the complaints, the investigations, what the competition commission does, the cases which go to the NCLAD, which go to the Supreme Court, and the kind of penalties that we see in the newspapers, you know, 100 crores, 500 crores, 1,000 crores, $1 billion, not, not, not only in India, even globally, uh, billions of dollars of antitrust trust cases are uh, levied, and all the good big brand names that we today know, like Make My Trip, or Oyo, or iVivo, or Google, I mean, with no offense to these, they're, they're doing great job, by the way, but still, Somewhere or the other, looks like certain companies step on the wrong side of the law, uh, be it uh, in anti-competitive agreements, or be it how they behave when they become a dominant enterprise, or be it uh, when you know mergers and acquisitions takes place. For example, now we have an impending merger that was reported in the Times of India between Air India and Vistara. 
Now, do all these things come under the purview of competition? One is the procedural approval of the CCI. The other is how does the CCI look at it? Uh, or these large combinations, do they really become monopolistic? If somebody is doing a good job uh, and they are dominant and they are sort of, they have a good market share, say 60%, 80%, by definition, do they automatically become monopolistic or, or anti-competitive? These are the several sort of questions that we will seek answers to from Mr. Sharma today. And uh, where I think Mr. Sharma, uh, the expectation of the, uh, the webinar would be, if you could touch upon your experiences, um, not just the law, but your experience in practicing uh, in CCI, in NCLAT, what kind of cases you see, what learnings do you have, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll have some Q&A also. So the structure is as such uh, for everybody that uh, Mr. Sharma will take around 50, 55 minutes of running his presentation and sharing his knowledge. And then we'll, uh, uh, towards the end, we'll have 15, 20 minutes of uh, Q&A. If anybody has any question in mind uh, right now, you can put it in the Q&A box. So you have a chat box, you have a Q&A box. Uh, do not uh, use the chat box. Uh, chat box can be for hello, hi, that's okay. But Q&A is something where I will be picking up the questions from Mr. Sharma. Okay, so just before we start in a minute or so, I hand over the, before I hand over, uh, let me just run a poll so that it gives, uh, gives an idea of the audience. So if you can just quickly do this poll, uh, if you can describe yourself, are you in employment or are you in practice or consulting? Just so that Mr. Sharma also knows the flavor of the audience. Uh, uh, and the second question is, do you have any practical experience in competition laws? Uh, we'll just wait for say 30 seconds so that we all have an idea, or especially Mr. Sharma has an idea, uh, and therefore he can modulate his uh, presentation accordingly. Okay, uh, any which ways, uh, uh, I'll- I think so with that, you should leave it to the people to do in the middle. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Start. So, I think that's that's what I'm saying. You, can, you can start uh, yeah, this, I'll end the poll in the middle. They can put the the people, putting the poll in between also when they when I'm speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or sure. let these, because the time is short with you. Yes, yes, yes. Mr. Sharma, I know you are most eager to sort of now start. So over to you, Mr. Sharma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sumit. And uh, you have given a sort of, what you call a layman's understanding of what competition law is and a broad uh, you know, understanding. And I good that you remember your MRTP law, but the competition law is actually entirely different. It's a new thing. It's not a old wine and new bottle. It's a new bottle, new wine, absolutely new. So before I begin, I would like to take you through a bit of background because you must know what we are talking about, what competition we are talking about. So you see, we are talking about competition in the markets, as we all know. And competition brings with it these uncertainties of the market. And competition brings out the best in us. So when there is competition, you try to be the best because you don't know what the other will do. So it makes your employees more efficient. I mean, just the general terms, which I must uh, sort of say. And I am a firm believer of this fact that if there is genuine competition in our markets, and there's a fair competition in the market, our economy can grow exponentially. Why? Because it is not only the uh, that the consumer will be benefit by the Competition because of getting wider choice, better goods, cheaper goods, wider, you know, lesser prices, etc. But it is also the producer will also benefit because the producer will be efficient, their quality will improve, and their profit margin will also increase because of the uh, kind of good quality of and uh, volumes of uh, volumes will also increase. So it is kind the competition law in modern competition law is not the competition law which you talking about the MRTP, which was a you know thing of the bygone era of the socialist economy. Competition law today, what we are talking is the free market economy. Let the market decide. Less and less government interventions. So competition law doesn't presume, doesn't actually believe in intervention by the government. So the government is off. Government is kept away and the markets are left free to decide and the best should survive. So the, those who are laggards will perish. So you see the case of Nokia, etc. They are all gone. Where they, are, they are not there. They didn't change according to the time. So that's what competition we're talking about. The best in you should come out. So, but India has been a late starter in understanding this importance of this competition. What, I, what I'm talking about is, and let me give a bit of background. The Americans, the what, what law which we discussed today is an American law. It's called antitrust. What is an antitrust? You must, you must be hearing this term, but you must not be, all of you may not be familiar with what antitrust actually is. So in the late 90s, in the late 80s, 80s and 80s, 90s, there were trusts, huge trusts in the U.S., and you know, Standard Oil Company, Rockefeller, and they, they were controlling from pin to air, air, everything. 
they were controlling almost every sector of the economy. There were few monopolies who were called trust at that time. And so the President Roosevelt at that time, he broke these trusts by bringing the Sherman Act. So in 19, the Americans were the first to start this understanding the importance of competition, followed by the Canadians. Canada, Canada also followed in a, day, a year or so. And then the Japanese followed it. Japanese followed it in 1947 after the World War. So Japan is known to be aping the West. So they did ape the West in this concept also. So you can see what the economy of Japan and Americans are, have grown to. The world's largest economy, second largest economy because of the competition. Then the Europeans understood the benefits. So in 1957, we had a Treaty of Rome where Europe you know, accepted the model competition law. And after Europe came the Australia, that is 1967, that 1917 one act was made. And then much, much later in 1991, India understood this importance of this competition. And you might recall, our economy was opened, you know, by Sadar Manmohan Singh, the then finance minister under the prime ministership of Mr. P. V. Narasimha Rao. So he was, he is actually credited in having opened the economy uh, to the world because the, at that time, our conditions were very bad. We, were, we desperately wanted foreign direct investment. And, but the foreign, in the, in the WTO, the government of India at that time made a commitment that we'd open our markets truly to competition. Then only the foreign companies were ready to you know, put in billions of dollars in India at that time, which we desperately needed. So in 1991, we followed, we changed from the so-called mixed economy model or socialist economy to the free market economy. Slowly, we actually changed our path. So 1991 actually is a watershed, which we all must remember. And that's the time when MRTP Act was also amended. So you would recall that the MRTP Act was amended in 1991, when even the public sector enterprises were also brought in the purview of the MRTP. Earlier they were not. Earlier the public sector enterprise could not have been complete, I guess. So this decade, which we say from 1960 to 1991, the economists call it the lost decades. We actually lost decades. And that's not we try to catch up with what, 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 what kind of growth we had at that time. The Hindu root of growth. Our economy never grew more than 33% in those 30 years. It is because of this, the whenever the government controls a business, you know, this is going to happen like this. I'm not, I'm not blaming that the government uh, is bad or whatever, but the, the system is such, the bureaucracy is, is such that they, they do not, because there's a, there's a, you know, there's a kind of complicity, I would say, I'm sorry to say. I've been also in the government, I know. In business is a different ball game altogether. Business must be left to the businessman. And that's why I remember a, in a recent, you know, seminar I was, I heard uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Vedanta, uh, Mr. Goel, in the presence of the Prime Minister himself, saying uh, government has no business to win business. I mean, this is the utmost statement which any, any, a very daring statement which somebody could have made at that time. So that concept in mind, this is what the competition law we are talking about. So we have, we actually opened with liberalization, privatization, globalization, the LPG model actually brought in. So the LPG model was brought in and the market was slowly, slowly open to global challenges. Even, you know, now you see what happened. Now, what, what has happened as a result of that? Don't you see it? See the kind of choices we have got. We had only Air India at that time. Now see the airlines we have got. We had only Ambassador and Fiat at that time. Now see the kind of cars we have got. Any sector you see, don't you see multiple choices available to the consumer? And at the same time, don't you see that not only the choices, but also the rates are coming down? I'll give an example. The best example is telecom. In telecom sector, when we open the, it to a competition, see what is happening. Our rates are the cheapest in the world. The rates of mobile telephony in India are the cheapest in the world. So that is the benefit of competition the consumer has got. So ultimately, what has happened? The consumer has become the king. Consumer has become the king. May I request uh, uh, Mr. Pawa to please share the screen, my presentation on the screen, so that uh, I can take it through. Or you want me to do it, I can do that. Whichever way. Handy with you, you can do that, sir. Otherwise, if you want me, I can. I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. Okay. I'll just it. will be easier because you can maneuver and whichever Exactly, way. exactly, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So let me do it with my way. Okay, fine. So this is the this is the context in which we have started. So we had lost decades, and you know what happened. And I make one more. I'll take one 30 second more to make this comment, which is very important. You know what has happened as a result of the lost decades led to brain drain. We we, we our people left to US. All IIT, you know, the top of the IIT our leaders went to US and other uh, developed countries. And the result is today, Sundar Pichai is a CEO of Google, but he's in US. He should have been in India. Why not? Why it happened is because we did not understand the importance of competition. I'm a very firm believer. That's why I say hey, I'm a strong supporter of fair competition in the market because I know that is the only panacea for India's growth. 
we have seen the economy of Australia. Australia model is there with, 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 with us. So now the, the, the last decade, what the what we have lost is because now we become a market for consumers. We become a market for service providers. We should have been a market for innovators. We should have been innovating. Where is the innovation today in India? The West looks at is look, looks at us as a, as a consumer economy. You know, we are consumer. We are ex to be exploited. If this we had he, had we embraced the true competition at that time, earlier in 50s, India would have been very much higher than even China and anybody. This is my strong comment. I want I cannot stop by saying it because now we have become from innovators in the past. You know, we had the Rishis and all those who had all those kind of things you might be knowing. Now we have the we are just consumers. So we are just consumer for the market economy. That's all. So with this background. I wrote this article, and this is what I want to draw your attention: making India competitive. It's my, it's my basically tagline on my Twitter also. So what has happened is that India has opened to most of the private sector, but there are still some sectors in the economy. And this I wrote when Mr. You know the Prime Minister was talking about making India a five trillion dollar economy, US five trillion dollar. Then I wrote, I said, sir, good, you have got a vision, but do you realize? And you and I know he's also a very good supporter of competition. The Prime Minister, I know. But the point is, he has not opened the, all sectors of the economy to the competition. There are still sectors like coal, electricity, for example. Has it been unbundled completely? No, the state governments, they are still controlling the electricity generation. So it's, it's still, uh, where is the open access? Nothing, except for Bombay and Delhi, maybe. Where is the competition in the discount? There's no competition. So the point is, we have not yet understood the importance of this law. And that's why I suggested in this article that we should embrace what the Australians have done, a national competition policy. So we desperately need a national competition policy, whereby every policy, every legislation of the government will be seen from the angle of competition, whether it's going to benefit competition or not. So this is my broad understanding I wanted to give you. And I thought uh, uh, this was important for to put this context. And now let me come to the law as such. So this was what I was talking about, the policy or the economy, but what the law is, how law is, the vast reach of law, if you see this joke, which I've just put up. So this was a joke about interest, I, I call it as an antitrust joke. So when prices went up, the judges said it was monopoly. And when the prices went down, they said it is a predatory pricing. And when they stayed the same, they say it was a cartel. So this is the joke, which is you know written in a book called The Fire of the, Farm by the Truth. And it is about three MDs of top US companies who met in jail. All of them were in jail. So when the first one said, I am here because I was a, the only producer, I was a monopoly and my prices were increasing. Second said, no, I, I was even selling very cheap, but they said it is predatory pricing. And the third one said, my price was same as my competitors, but they said, you are in a cut. So in any way, you can be, you can be caught. So now I'll go straight to the uh, scheme of my presentation. I'll introduce the competition law. There's an economic law, as I said, understanding markets behavior. So a competition law, sir, is more of a economic law. It's it's not a law. It's the MRTP Act was which was about the concentration of wealth under Article th under Article 39 or whatever of the Constitution because at that time we had a socialist model of economy. So the private sector was looked with suspicion at that time. Not no no longer. So you can be as big as Reliance, but you should not abuse that bigness. So to be big is not bad, but to abuse that bigness is bad. That's what this. So competition, I'll give you quickly, prohibition, cartels, etc. I'll just touch you through, and then abuse of dominant position. So there are three pillars, basically, of this law. The first pillar is anti-competitive agreement. If you are, if you are, so if you are a competitor, you should compete. And what the competition means, you should compete fairly. That means you should not know what your competitor is doing, it should the market should only decide who is the better of you. But if you start doing the otherwise, you start talking to each other, whether uh, individually or whether at the platform of uh, association, there are chances that the competition will be reduced. Since we advise a number of trade associations, large ones in India, so this is what my first advice to them is, please don't do anything which reduces market uncertainties. Understand? So that is the one. And then provision of cartels, provision of dominance. The third pillar is combination. m and uh, Sumit mentioned about it. Why the m and need to be regulated? I'll take later on, but this is just a scheme. So how, why not to ignore what are the strong powers the CCI has got and what will happen if you com competition law is violated, etc. And then how, if you know competition law can help your growth. 
and even profits. That also I'll touch upon very briefly. And then lastly, if time permits, I'll touch upon the amendment, which are now in the offering because the amendment bill of 2022 is in the parliament, which has been referred to the Standing Committee of on Finance. So I'll quickly go through this slide because most of the, much of them I've already uh, you know, discussed. So uh, as you said, it's economy, and I'll not repeat because this I've already spoken. So please have go through the slide quickly. Why we need competition in the market is this. So it's, it's in the interest of, as I said, both consumers as well as producers, total welfare. Again, the same thing I'm just repeating. We do efficiency market, wider choice, to opti optimal utilization of scarce resources, maximize profits, uh, welfare of both. And what is unfair competition currency? I'll look at this also. So collusive practices, reduction in output, et cetera, creation of entry, entry barriers, allocation of markets, time, sales, et cetera, et cetera. So these are various facets of unfair competition. I'll deal with them a little later. Predatory pricing, I just mentioned, discriminatory and fair pricing, and market excess, denial of market excess, refusal to deal exclusivity. Exclusivity is a big concern. Contracts with supplementary obligations, I'll deal with that also later. So what the law, structure of law, let us understand. The law actually was notified in 2013, uh, three, January 2003. Before that, there was a high power committee set up by the government after it opened the economy, as I said, in 1991 to suggest a new law because the WTO said, your law is still old. Fine, you've amended the act but we want a new law. So they were forced to set up a committee in 1998, which gave a report in 2000, around 2000. And then this competition act took uh, about two, three years in parliament and various ministries, et cetera. So this is the act, what it is. So the preamble is very important to eliminate practices having appreciable adverse effect on competition, to promote and sustain competition, to protect interests of consumers and to ensure freedom of trade. So these are the broad, you see, uh, objectives under which the law has been framed. The sections is 18, which gives this. And now the features of this law, as you said, profits, anti competitive agreement, I said four pillars. I've spoken about three pillars. Now the fourth pillar is, is important. That is advocacy. Competition advocacy is also an essential part of this law because it enjoins upon the regulator to spread the law to all our participants, to all the stakeholders, whether it is businesses, whether it is consumers, whether it is producers, distributors, whatever. So this advocacy is under section 49. Section three is anti cooperative agreement. Section four is abuse of dominant position. Section five and six deal with the combinations. And 49 is advocacy. And under the advocacy, I must tell you that advocacy is not only limited to telling the uh, people about the importance of competition, et cetera. It is also about telling the government, you know, about regulating the laws, about actually regulating their policies also in a manner, if possible, to be competition friendly. So now you will see this advocacy, but I, 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 I mean, I will not be candid enough to say I actually, till I was in the CCI, I hardly had any, you know, I, it was too long by 2008, I left. At that time, of course, CCI was also not functioning, but we were doing only advocacy. But during the advocacy, we were not hardly, you know, once upon, I remember Mr. Dal got a reference from the Ministry of Civil Aviation, but there were hardly any policies which used to come to us. But I believe now the government has taken note of it and the finance minister is very, very proactive and she interacts with the commission. I, this is my knowledge and personal knowledge. So this is the uh, frame of the law. So this is the basically the structure, three, three broad you know, types of conduct or agreements which the act seeks to regulate, anti-competitive agreements. Sorry, I'll just go back. Yeah, anti government agreements, cartels, abuse of down position, and the merger control. This I've already said. So I'm now on the anti competitive agreements. Uh, Mr. Sharma, you can uh, again do the uh, screen uh, mode, means the full okay, screen. Okay, okay, fine. I'll do that. Just give me a minute. Is it better? Yes, it's good. Yes. So now I come to this important pillar of the competition law that is anti-competitive agreements. So not all agreements, it is agreement which are against competition. That is what is actually prohibited. And section three deals with such agreements. And now let me tell you these agreements need not be in writing. These need not be even in writing. These need not be, they could be even informal understandings also are included. So, you know, mere, as you used to say, I used to say mere nod in a case of a cartel. You know, suppose you are sitting in a, 
a meeting of an association and you would start discussing, well, our profits are going down. We are all competing among ourselves what to do. And somebody says, why don't we uh, try to, why don't we fix the you know level of the prices? And somebody says, yes, okay, fine. So even if he nods, even that nod is an agreement under the law. It need not provided it is recorded. I mean, I'm reminded of a movie, a Hollywood movie, you know, the informant where this was the case, the FBI, this how they busted the cartel, they actually videographed a meeting. Anyway, so this anti-competitive agreements are very, very broad. Agreement term is very broad under the law. Any kind of understanding, even tacit understanding is covered. So there are two kinds of anti-competitive agreement, horizontal agreements, that is between the direct competitors, which include cartels, but not all kind of agreements. Agreement to fix prices, to limit or control production or supply, to allocate customers or territories or bid rigging or collusive bidding. So these five kinds of agreements, if are entered into between direct competitors are horizontal agreements. They are anti-competitive agreements and they are actually presumed to be having what is known as appreciable adverse effect on competition. And there is a limited exception to that. That is for joint ventures. So joint ventures between competitors are allowed provided they increase efficiency, which can be demonstrated. And the second kind of agreements are vertical agreements, that is exclusive supply agreements or distribution agreement, refusal to deal, tying in resale price maintenance. This is very prevalent in India. We get the maximum you know, kind of advisories on resale price maintenance. Can I say uh, MOP? Can I say MIP, market operating price, market infiltration price, such kind of terminologies the companies use, corporate use very often without realizing that if you are the manufacturer, after you've sold the good to your retailer, to your distributor, you are out of the picture. You're not supposed to tickle with that distributor any further except for the margin which you might decide with him. But no, 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 we want our goods to be sold not below this price. The moment the management takes that decision, you are being caught by the law. So a manufacturer has no business to decide the price at which the goods will be sold after it has sold the goods to down the line distributor or super distributor, whatever it is. Then the distributor has to take call as per the market at what price he should sell or for the resale to the, say, the dealer or the sub-distributor or the stockist or whatever. So in different sectors, there are different kinds of distribution chains. I'll deal with it in a little later. So the exclusive supply agreements, these are all vertical agreements. Now, these vertical agreements are not bad per se. They are good because without these agreements, you know, your economy can't, your business can't go. So you need to they are not presumed to have AAC. They're not per se bad. They're not prohibited. They are presumed to be, they are, they're not presumed to have AAC, but they are decided by what is known as rule of reason. So CCI will see the pro-competitive factors and the anti-competitive factors. They are given under section 19.3, you know, creating bar barriers to entry, foreclosure of the market, etc. And also on the positive side, whether they create efficiency in distribution, whether they, you know, the consumers are benefited in any manner or whether they are leading to improvement in technology, etc. So these vertical agreement and horizontal agreement, these, those, these two agreements, I would request each of you please to note very carefully that direct competitors, cartels, of course, bad, absolutely. Vertical agreements may be bad, provided the certain conditions fulfilled, which I come later. Now I'll give you some examples quickly. I'll give you the, the recent examples of cartel cases. You may have noticed. And I'll just not give the details of this case for shortage of time, but I'm just, my slides is quite, uh, you know, clear. <coughs> Since we are involved in some of the cases, I would not like to, it would not be fair for me to disclose these. Why, sir? Then CBET cartel, you must have heard all of you, LPG cartel case, the insurance cartel. So in this insurance cartel, even insurance companies of the government were penalized, you know, public sector insurance companies were penalized. National insurance, United insurance, they were all penalized. 670 crores was issued, penalty. Now I come to abuse of dominance. But before I that, if you could just again, although people understand cartel, but any example on a no-name basis, Anything that you'd like to share of, you know, how cartels were made? I mean, very broadly without... I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. How to, I'll tell you something about cartels. So the cartels may, you see the, there is a recent judgment of the Supreme Court in Rajasthan Cylinder where the Supreme Court has, uh, and uh, since I was involved in that case, it was LPG Cylinder's cartel. LPG Cylinder Manufacturing's cartel. I'll just give you an example of flavor of how a cartel is like. So LPG Cylinder, the cylinder manufacturer, the domestic cylinder which you use in your kitchen, 
you know, 14.5 kg cylinder is being manufactured by various various companies across India for the for the to supply to the three OMCs, the IOCL, BPCL, and HPCL. Right? Every year the tender is called. So everybody knows what the price of the last year is, correct? So they all try to bid near that price. So the prices are quite clear, quite nearer to each other. So in one such case, in 2009 or 10, there was a tender by the IOCL, and that in that tender, one of the bidder did not get a uh, did not get the tender. So he complained to CCI that they are all in a cartel, right? So that the, the, this case started this LPG cylinder manufacturer cartel, and uh, that cartel actually went on the CCI penalized everybody. I was the only counsel representing the uh, these members of the cartel. I was representing 44 companies out of 50 in that time. And I said, Milan, it is not possible to have a cartel because the, everybody knows the price of the last year. So we will try to quote the same price. We know every year is a repeated tender. But the CCI did not hear as a market condition, you must look at it. So in any case, what happened was that the prices were quite near to the nearest PESA. So if your prices are same, parallel pricing is an important indicator that there may be a cartel in the industry. In fact, in a, in a tender, you should quote competitively. And if you're quoting competitively, you should not know what the other person has, caught, has bid. So if you don't know, as I say, uncertainty in the market, naturally the price will not be parallel. But this was not the case in this case. I'm trying to be on both sides. I'm being devil's advocate. I'm also trying to be from the government side also. So that was the crux of the case. Parallel pricing, there were plus factors also. Plus factor means that over and over the over and over the parallel pricing, there are certain factors which also indicate towards the cartel. For example, there was a trade association, a very strong trade association, which used to meet every year, right? And they used to, apparently they never said that we discussed prices. But that was the understanding of the people that otherwise how the prices of a person sitting in Faridabad will be same as a person sitting in Chennai. At that time, the, the, the CST rates were different. You know, the taxes were different. State taxes were different. There was no GST at that time. So this was the allegation by the CCI. And allegation were proved because of this fact that their prices were actually matching. So the matching of the prices is an indication of cartel. The Having an association is an indicator of a trade association. Having, if you're active in a trade association, you can certainly be seen. But apart from that, I'll give you something interesting. How to prove a cartel, how the CCI proves a cartel, what it looks for. That is something which you must take. So there are two kinds of evidences. One is the direct evidence, that there is evidence of communication. There are nine cartels in this country which I've written articles about. People, and recently this, by the way, this beer cartel, this craft cartel, I'll just tell you, take you back. This cartel about the uh, craft paper, which I was involved in, I'll just give you craft paper cartel. You know what happened in this case? This craft paper is what? The craft paper is the paper in which you get your products from Amazon. You know, the craft boxes. The rough paper in which the boxes are made. So all the people who used to make boxes for these uh, internet giants, they complained to CCI that the craft paper manufacturers have suddenly increased the prices all over India. This was about, it started in Gujarat and Maharashtra, but CCI was went overboard and it started looking all over. It's, it's South India, North India. I was representing companies in North India, somebody was representing South India. So this all started happening. So they were people, what they had done, they had formed a WhatsApp group. There, there were three or four groups of WhatsApp. There was papers, newspapers and caps. And in that group, everybody was member. Not only the, you know, not only the manufacturers, but even the dealers were also members. And they were quoting prices. Okay, let us increase the price by one rupee from so-and-so date. Such messages were there. So these messages were also with the hand of the dealers who were also, you know, dealing with the they are uh, buyers. And who were the buyers? The corrugate manufacturers. Corrugate box manufacturer of the buyers of these people. They got hold of these messages through some dealer and they took out the entire printout and they gave it to say, say look, it's a direct evidence. So this kind of WhatsApp, etc. are also, so evidence could be direct evidence. It could be circumstantial evidence. It could be even economic evidence. As I said, evidence of conduct. The structure of the market, but that is a detailed thing. I will not be able to give much time on that. So the point is, cartels are CCI is now on overboard. CCI is you know, trying to fix cartels. Maximum number of cartel cases are there. Maximum have been decided. But please be very careful that do not ever, first of all, try to talk to your competitor on sensitive issues and don't even exchange information. That is a subject which I can deal later. Information exchange is very, very crucial to understand. And also, don't be, if, there's no harm in being active in the association. But please try to put your absence in record if you're leaving an association where something sensitive is being discussed. That's my take to you. All, all corporates who are in today in the. 
So the association minutes are taken, their down rate is done, the CCI conduct down rate, and anything is incrementing their fine, then you will be hard on explaining, you go keep on spending money on the Abhishek Singhvis and things like that, nothing will happen. They will all lose. So the point is, cartels are the worst form of anti-competitive conduct you can be caught off. And there's no, and the only thing is to come out is to go to leniency. If suppose you are involved actually, please accept that as soon as possible and go to the CCI so that at least your fine is reduced. You get a waiver up to 100% if you go first. So there are stages of that waiver, up to 30% they can give, not more than that. And now of course they have, uh, you know, they have actually uh, 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 lenient, fur further relax the leniency provision. Anybody can go, there's no limit. That only the first three will be caught, will be considered, everybody can go. And now leniency plus is also being there. So the point is the cartels are the worst form. I would avoid people to be very careful. Please be watch your conduct of your salespeople very carefully. It's those people who are actually generally are unaware of the law and then they get caught and then let the and the company suffer. And I'll just tell you what how the companies suffer later on. So now I'm talking about the famous cases of Google of the Android Dom. Uh, let me sorry, I forgot to tell about dominant position once again. Just a second. Yeah. So about anti-competitive agreements, I've explained. But if you want, I can spare some time about the vertical agreements later on. Vertical restraints, if somebody wants, I can give you that in the question answer session. Otherwise, I'll tell you very clearly. The vertical agreements are of whether they are of dealing restrictions. There are restrictions which the manufacturer puts on their dealers. Right? This could be either a dealing, dealing restriction or a pricing restriction. Dealing restriction is like exclusive supply or exclusive distribution agreements. Pricing restriction is like minimum resale price, dual pricing, two-part tariffs, rebates, discounts, etc. And there are non-pricing restrictions also possible. Tying in, bundling, what the internet companies are doing this, this. Refusal to deal, etc. So, but the substantial law of competition on all these kind of vertical restraint is same. And please take this from me, that that is these restraints are harmful only when the parties, either of the parties have some degree of market power. If you are strong in the market, and if you deal in these kind of restrictions, if you impose restriction, whether it is upstream or downstream, this will have an AAC. So it's only when the uh, degree of market power or your large market share, either your manufacturer or a dealer, and if you enter into such vertical restraints, if you impose exclusivity on any of your dealer or any or vice versa, so that it can ability to foreclose the market. So foreclosure of the possibility of foreclosure is the only harm which the Competition Commission looks at in these vertical agreements. So that is, and, and it depends on what? It also depends on degree of interbrand competition. So if the interbrand competition is strong, even if you are strong in market share, your exclusivity agreement may not have any issue. But if the interbrand competition is less, that means there are less number of players, then certainly it, is, it can have a more foreclosure issue. So these are things of economics, but I just thought of sharing it because time short, time short it is there. Now dominance. Now, unlike the MRTP Act, where the dominance was being screen, I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I just for the very yeah. of Yes, I hope it's visible to everybody. So, unlike the what do you call unlike the MRTP Act, uh, you see the uh, Competition Act doesn't uh, you know uh, abhor the bigness. As I say, large. You can be as large as anybody. It is, and what is dominant position? First of all, what is dominance? Uh, let me just take back. Sorry, it's, I'm a little slow today, so please permit me. Yeah. So what is dominance? First, let us understand the concept of dominance such as because most of the people come to us and say, well, our market share is 40%, are we dominant? Our market share is touch now 50%, are we dominant? So I give them an the example of Pepsi and Coke. You know, Pepsi and Coca-Cola, they have almost same, roughly the same amount of market share. Pepsi, if suppose Pepsi has 55% or if Coke has 45% or vice versa, are any of them dominant? The answer is no. Why? If you are having a competition in the market and if you have enough competitive constraint in the market which can regulate your behavior in the market, then you cannot be dominant. But the market is important. What market we are talking about? I give another example. Can we say Maruti is dominant 
in the market for car then I'll, then i'll ask myself is car a market no car is not a market there are various segments in the market there are segment of you know up to 2 to 3 lakhs maybe there are there are bigger size mid size small size and then there are you know uh, luxury cars and there are premium segment etc so these each segment of car form a different market so you have to see from the side of the demand what the market so demand actually demand side as i said substitutability constitute the market a relevant product market so the market determination is very important for, for dominance for determining the dominance of a player whether you are dominant or not first the commission has to determine the correct market and then in that market they see whether it is the company is dominant or not and again, and moreover the tendency of the large player is always to define the market as broadly as possible So I'll give you the example of United yes, Brands. Um, so United yeah, Brands. Mr. Sharma, I think your camera is suddenly switched off. Uh, I can't see you. Do you want me to show the video? Do you want? Okay, fine. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. It's it's always good to sort of see you also along with the screen. Yeah. yeah. No, no. So I was just giving example of dominance. Dominance is a very subjective concept. It's highly economic concept. So and I'll give you the best definition possible. The dominance is according to me, which I've seen from the literature, is the ability of a firm to sustain prices profitably. above competitive levels or to restrict output or quality below competitive levels i think if you note down these two lines the entire competition jurisprudence in your hands ability of a firm to sustain prices profitably above competitive levels or to reduce output or quality below competitive level so you see the market when it is fairly competitive it sets a benchmark for itself well this will be the price for this product the market knows ये चीज दस रुपए की है दस रुपए की होगी इट कैन नॉट बी नोट फिफ्टीन रुपीज दार्केट नोज राइट ना इफ यू आर मोनोप्ली देन यू आर दिल्ली प्रोड्यूसर देन यू डोट केयर बट इफ यू आर मोनोप्लीज एट इज गॉन मोनोप्लीज आर गॉन दे आर लिविंग ऑलोकोप्लेस्टिक कॉम्पिटिशन देर आर वेरियस प्लेयर्स सो इन इन एन ऑलोकोप्लीज सिचुएशन इफ यू आर अ स्ट्रॉन्ग प्लेयर यू कैन यू डू इन दिस मैनर दैट यू कैन इंक्रीज द प्राइस विदाउट बॉदरिंग वॉट द कॉम्पिटिशन विल डू नेचुरली पीपल विल गो टू दर साइड you cannot do it but if you are so strong that you have the ability to increase prices above competitive levels then you are certainly dominant it doesn't depend on your market share alone the market share is very important but market share alone is not determinant for dominance that is the first point i want to make the second the most important point which i just said is the ability of a firm are you so strong if you are not strong then you can as i gave the example of pepsi and coca cola so it is highly economics so we actually have to see whether the what is the size of the market what is the kind of market we are dealing in what is the market structure right and then where is your position in the market so there are both kinds of people there are large players but as far as cci is jurisprudence is concerned let me tell you that they have they are very fair they they determine their uh, dominance very very fairly and they use all economic trick tools to really uh, arrive at the right position give the example of dlf dlf in at the time when dlf was fined dlf was the first case CCI imposed six hundred seventy crores fine. If you would recall, about twelve years back, two thousand ten or eleven, in Gurugama, DLF was the only builder at that time, which was actually very big. And DLF, in fact, there were hardly any builders at that time except DLF. So at that time, Blair Association people went in to the CCI and said, "Look, they they promised us very fourteen floor. They paid nineteen floor for this. We'll fight on parking." so all kind of thing and they change the you know terms and condition etc etc of unfair condition i'm not going to the real estate sector because there's a whole pandora box will open but what i'm trying to say is dlf at that time was found to be dominant but after say about 10 years another case was filed against dlf and you know csi closed that case csi said no they are not dominant now anymore there are many players have coming so concept of dynamism or dominance is actually dynamic nokia was dominant one time nokia is where no nowhere now so this and i am come to the context of even internet markets also they are dynamic it is not always possible google was nobody when microsoft was 1995 was ruling the world yahoo was there internet explorer was there where was google google actually went to the ftc and complained and on google's complaint only microsoft was broken to three parts they had to make their browser you know compatible with the google that that now the google is google so the point is the markets keep on changing dominance is a concept which cannot be dependent on market share why because market share will change the moment a maverick app enters the market a new player enters who is a maverick he destroys the structure of the market new thing will come technology also is a important game changer we have now disruptive technologies which are on the way 
the new technology, the new big tech companies are actually disruptive. You know, they change the market dynamics in a minute. Totally different. Nobody thought this will happen. AI is coming. So the point is, without going to the details of that, the dominance, I want to just make a quick point that what determines dominance is the level of concentration in the market. How many players are there? What is the level of potential competition in the market? You should determine your, do you have enough competitive constraint? I give the example of Grassim. Grassim is the only manufacturer of a fiber called viscous stable fiber in India. Its only competition is what? Imports. So if you have, you are the only manufacturer, then of course import should be allowed. But to stop that import, what do you do? You go to anti-dumping authority and get anti-dumping rules. That's what they did. 30 years they had anti-dumping benefit. So then you become absolutely monopoly. Absolute monopoly. And then you do what you do. What did what Gassim did, I don't want to spend time on this. 360 crores, but I'll discuss it very briefly. So this kind of conduct will happen. So level of competition. If you have no competitive constraint, you will do what you what you should not be doing. And that would be a dominant position. So these four or five bullets, please note down. Unfair or discriminatory pricing including predatory pricing, limiting production or technical development, denial of market access, conclusion of contracts subject to supplementary obligation, use of a dominant position to, of one market to enter into a product another market. So these are the various facets of dominance. I'm sorry, I've taken much more time, but we have to now take it quickly. So these are the famous, some uh, important recent cases of abuse of dominant position. Please have a look at it. Google in the first Android case, you know, Android mobile device, everybody has Android phone. So Android OS, they, many, they control. So they also control Play Stores, you know, 1337 crore penalty. Second Android case, you know, dominant position in the Play Store, Google Pay. They in-app purchases in the Play Store, they compulsory have to go through Google Pay. This was the case which was filed and they had they, they were penalized. Sorry, again, I jumped. Sorry for this. And then this, this recent case of Make My Trip and you know, OYO imposing price parity. Uh, price parity is what in, in the terms of online uh, online travel agencies that you will the hotel will not give a better rate or a better room than the rate which you'll offer to my customers. So I am your exclusive you know partner for online bookings. That is called wide parity. There's a narrow parity, by the way. And the narrow parity means you will not give a rate better than what you'll give on your own website. But so that means in your own website, you can give a better rate, which you can give on me, my, my platform. So that is price parity. And of course, they had exclusive dealing with OYO. So the budget hotels were all out. That's why Fab Hotels and Trebo, you know, they complained to the CCI and they, of course, won. So, and then Grassin case. Grassin case is very interesting. As I just gave you a little facts. What were they doing is that they were actually, um, they had created a kind of license Raj in India, private license Raj. So they were not giving the fiber. They were only manufacturer of a fiber. You know, what is viscous stable fiber? It goes into your beautiful Louis Vinta, you know, shirts. Louis Philip, you must be wearing all of you. So these shirts have viscous because they're crispness. All uniforms of army, navy, all the air forces, all the kind of services, uniforms, even school uniforms has viscous because it gives you crispness of wood-based fiber. Unlike the polyester fiber, which is oil-based, crude oil-based. So they, they, this is only made by Grassin. And they were do, saying that We'll give you, uh, you have to give 100% advance to us if you want to buy fiber from me. I'm the only monopoly. So naturally, spinners had no choice. They say, yes, we want. Demand is huge. But sir, discount? Yeah, we'll give you 40% discount, but we'll give you at the end of the year. Provided you give your company for audit by us. That means how much of you have exported this cars and how much of you have used my fiber, right? And that discount was also orally given. There was nothing in writing. So in all, you know, the worst kind of conduct which you can consider, if you read this case, Grassim Industries case, absolutely worst case. Appeal is pending since I'm involved. My views will be a little biased, I'm sorry. But the point is that I have not seen a case as, I have not seen a classic, a rarest of rare case of abuse dominant like this Grassim case. Other cases, a few old cases, some shares in Kataria, the car spare part case, you may have heard of, Hyundai case, controlling discounts. They were having mystery shopping agencies, you know, Hyundai and even now Maruti is also involved in the same thing. They had, they had actually, you know, employed uh, mystery shopping shoppers. They will go to the dealer, distributor and sit down on the, like a customer and then they'll negotiate the discount. So if the dealer gives a discount, which is more than the discount, which the company has told them to give, the dealer will be issued a notice, right? 
and in the worst case, the dealer the dealership will be terminated also. So this is called controlling discounts by dealers. This is a vertical discount. You know, I told you price restriction. T series, BCCI case, long term long term exclusivity. BCCI had a ten year long contract with the uh, Sony TV for telecast of IPL. In fact, I wrote an article in 2011 at, in Economic Times on that, and the basis of that, somebody took the idea and filed a case. <laughs> I mean, I thought somebody will come to me, nobody came to me. The point is, I gave the idea to them because I really was shocked that why they have given a 10 years contract. Because all over the world, this long exclusivity is not accepted. The maximum slot you can have it for three years, at the max, five years. Anyway, ITPO case, dispute transparency, NSE case, I was involved with the consul for the Middle Stock Exchange also. So, predatory pricing, the only case. The first case to be decided on predatory pricing was the NSC case. What NSC was doing? They had started a currency derivative segment at that time in 2008, and they start giving it free for the brokers. So members of the NSC who were already brokers with them, they had they had not to pay any price, any transaction charges to NSC. They could do trading on the currency derivative segment, that is dollar rupee, you know, exchange rates. MCS XX was a new start, started this, you know, multi commodity exchange started at SX. Stock exchange also they started apart from the multi commodity exchange, and there they started considering every segment about eight months later than them. They said that we can't afford the zero pricing, we have to charge, and nobody's coming to us because NSC is controlling the entire market. NSC at that time had 92% share. So, this case was pretty pricing case. We unsuccessfully defended NSC, I must admit, because though we were successful in proving to the CCI that market is not stock exchange, stock exchange cannot be a market, each segment is a separate market, and which they agreed. With us, but then the CCI said something which we had no answer. They said, "Fine, you are not a leader in currency derivative. Both of you are competitors, but then you are a leader in the what is called as the equity market in the debt market or in the other you know FNO other markets where you have huge you know cash reserves and you are using your money there deep pockets to finance your you know zero pricing in currency derivative. It's called leveraging your dominance." In one market to enter another market. If you would have noticed the last bullet of section 42E, using your dominance in one market to enter or protect your position in the other market. That was the case. And we had no answer. Because at that time, NSE was not doing a segmental reporting. Of course, now they have started doing it. So each segment has a separate reporting audit is done. So that was the case of predatory pricing. DLF case, I've already told you one fair one side agreement is common to all real estate players. So much so that after this DLF case, Somebody went to CCI and I suppose Mr. Arora. He said, Well, they are having same conditions. All of builders have same standard terms and conditions, allotment buyer agreement, everything same, whether it is Lotus or whether it is anybody else, super tag or whatever. So they are in a cartel. So we defended one company in there in that, in that case also. We said, How can that be a cartel of terms and conditions? Come on. Anybody can buy it from the market and does it doesn't make a cartel. Of course, we are successful. That is not a cartel. So combination, sir, I am running out of time, but I must quickly go take you through this. It's a broad term, mergers, acquisitions, amalgamation, and acquisition of share control. But we have the highest threshold limits, you know, the highest threshold limit in the world, rather. But we have a mandatory regime, we have a suspensory regime. You have to give notice, and then CSA has given 210 days to decide. Otherwise, it's deemed as a It's a long time, I know, seven months. And Suomoto can, within one year also, can take, and after, I suppose, you fail, fail to notify, then CSA has got one year time to catch you. Without that, they can't. Of course, in the Amazon and Biani case, the, the, the controversy started that you started, you took cognizance after two years. Anyway, that I don't want to go to. And what are our threshold? Please have a look at it quickly. 2,000 crore of assets or 6,000 crore of turnover for a single standalone company. And if you're in a group, 8,000 crore of assets, 24,000 crore, very high thresholds. Still, the industry says we are being squeezed by this. It's not the case. CCI has been the best regulator as far as mergers and acquisitions are concerned, I can tell you. They have notified, they have uh, cleared so many mergers and so fast. The speed time limit is very fast. I'll just show you. There's an exemption de minimis. So basically, you should see the target size. If your target is having a less than 350 crore, turnover more than 1,000 crore, you need not even notify. Right? And the group definition also been relaxed to increase up to 50% voting rights in the companies. I can't give, go in detail of this. And then important merger, which you I just wanted to just take you through. Buyer Monsanto, I wrote an article of this also. PVR acquisition of DLF, Holson, Lafarge, Sun Pharma, and BXC, we were involved. Linda Plexia, we were involved. Anyway, now 
Now let us see the powers of CCI. So this is something which you should please take care. Cease and desist is the normal thing. Penalty for 10% of every turnover. In case of cartel, penalty for three times the cartelized profit. To declare an agreement having wide, they can even modify the agreement which no other courts have power. You know, and then they can uh, even divide the enterprise. Please note the last bullet. This is very rare. This is the this they've taken from the FTC's power to divide Microsoft. Microsoft was divided into three parts. And even before that, the big bells were divided, AT&T case in US, they went to mini bells. So this is the power which only in a competition regulator has in all countries. Power to divide large enterprises. Imagine, I can't name an enterprise, so many things should be divided. Anyway, so now these are the consequences, other consequences. Please note these, apart from the penalty which goes to the company, please note these consequences. Private damages out. So CCI is the first regulator of the competition at the, perhaps the first law which has now taken note of the class action suits. So now the DL, in DLF case, the allottees of Bel Air are waiting in wings for the final decision in the Supreme Court and they have all filed com com compensation claim before the NCAA. So suppose your company is found to be involved in either a cartel or an abuse of dominance. Apart from the fact that in case of a cartel, if you are, uh, you know, sometimes to a private, to a public sector, they will, of course, blacklist you. The private company can also take damages for the high profit you, uh, high price at which you sold them. That is possible. I told my clients in the craft paper case, well, fine. Even if we get you out of this, you can still be caught because your federation can go and say, well, look. So in this case, they, what has happened? They have been held to be in cartel, but of course, no penalty has been imposed uh, for mitigating factors and the cases like the market structure, which we explained to them. But the class action, then the agreement can be declared for nullified and penalty on individuals. Please note, chairmen, managing directors of large corporates are before CCI. And they're all in appeal before NCLT. We see daily. It's a civil offense, no doubt. The completion offense, I forgot to mention, is still a civil offense. It's not a criminal offense. But it can become a criminal offense if you fail to pay the penalty. You can be prosecuted and three years imprisonment is possible. Please see the last bullet. Uh, Mr. Sharma, we have uh, uh, some good questions also which have come can up. I just, can I just run through the list? Yeah, 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 two minutes, I, I, if you I can, please. Say. To take 10 more minutes if you could uh, sure, wrap up. Sure. Because I, what I'm going to tell you is more important. This yeah, was yeah. what I told you is just the law. Sure, sure. Yeah. What I'm going to tell you is more important. Sure, sir, so so this article me. I wrote in uh, Ignore CC at your own peril. Please have a look at your time, 2018. Came in Financial Express. Now see the journey of CCI. I'll just run through this. Antitrust cases registered from my disposal very fast. These are the major sectors where they have taken enforcement actions. And this data is up to date 31st March 2022. In combination case, you see registered 916 cases, disposed 908 cases, 99% disposal, as I said, the very fast. And their average working days is 17 working days. They clear a combination. And 97% have been approved without modifications. The regulatory structure is this very clearly. There's a Competition Commission of India, there's a Director General, then there's NCLT, and then the appeal goes to Supreme Court. There is no, in this statutory framework, there's no role for the High Court, by the way. Still, people go to the High Court. I give you the example of Subhashar Singh Atariya case. All car companies went to the High Court to challenge the DG's report. All of them lost. They're all in the now before the NCLT. They went to the Supreme Court also. Because they got deep pockets. Imagine Mercedes Benz. Imagine Audi. Even imagine Honda for that matter. Any, I'm just naming for just for the sake of it. All companies were advised by their lawyers to challenge it in the High Court. Because why? Mr. Mr. Arora named only three companies. Why DG has included all companies into the investigation? We were not named. What nonsense? See the act. The act empowers the CCI. So the point is, they all went to the High Court. Wrong advice. So please consult experts. That's my suggestion. Don't go to all law firms. All every law firm say, "Are itna sir to act a team to action hai." I can always advise. Every lawyer will tell you, but it's not that simple, sir. Competition law is highly specialized. The super specialized in law because it is economics plus law. Just as Brandis once said, a lawyer who was not studied economics is apt to become a public enemy. I'm making this statement. So it is economic law. Please understand. Then, of course, DG emerging trend has had more active enforcement. Five down rates. I just note down this famous case. You might dry cell battery. JCB was the first. Beer cartel, pulse cartel, tarpaulin cartel. And then what are the sources for potential source of evidence? Please have a look at them. This is important for you, all of us. Internal document, memos, circulars, emails, hard drives. They take the entire hard drive, presentations, board papers, agendas, phone records. You know, CDRs are commonly taken from the Airtel or from the Vodafone, etc. Wherever they investigate a card in the DE, first sends a letter to the Airtel. 
to your to your service provider. Please give the records of all these calls made by him. Expense account, completed document, SMS, and I said WhatsApp charts, common groups. I just give the example. So how, when can you seem to violate the law? So these are examples which I'm giving. Please see during bidding for supplies in public procurement or to large customers. When you are interacting with the customer, pre-bid discussions, exchange of prices, bid rigging, information exchange, please note this. Market allocation, vertical stand, I told you all these five, six examples. And in abuse of dominant position, if you have market share about 30%, please be careful. Do you discriminate between your customers? Do you have a pricing policy which is below or above, the, above your costs? Do you have unfair one-sided clause in your agreement? Have you ever refused to deal with a dealer without any justification? And do you impose supplementary obligation? As I gave you the example of Grassi. Grassi was asking the, uh, their buyers to give the details of their uh, exports or even to get themselves audited. How are you concerned here? Yeah? Your manufacturing is sold. That's it. Do you ex impose exclusivity? Exclusivity is a very common uh, you know, ground which corporates face. In fact, we did a webinar in during the lockdown on exclusivity clause in commercial agreements. If everybody wants, you can see my YouTube channel. It's there. Then when, uh, when to consult a competition law? This is another which I very quickly tell you that it is for manufacturers. When should your business, you know, how can it help your business? Now, please see. If your raw material or input supplier suddenly increase price without any justification, you can think of going to a competition lawyer. Or for example, your raw material suddenly collectively increase prices and then restrict discounts. Suppose you your supplier says that, no, I'm not going to give more discount. Then you perhaps you can go to the expert and ask what to do. Or your raw metal supplier forces you to buy your entire demand of raw metal from him or forces purchase of large quantities. And large quantities, I mean more than 70%. As a condition precedent for granting novel discount. Sir, this is a very normal practice in India. All suppliers who are in strong market position or who are both sought after, they control the market like this. They say, okay, we will we'll give a discount if you purchase so many. Volume discount is called. It's quite normal. But there are issues with this. And if you will supply, and if you are, because of your input prices, are your margins being affected? Maybe a competition lawyer can suggest you how to, be how to do. Or policies with business inclusion. Are you being charged excessive license fee, blah, blah. By court if fading. Or your unfair clause in the agreement, restrictive conditions. Or restrictive condition imposed by PS2 buyers. Suppose you are supplying to the government. And there are, and, and I get the maximum kind of case of that type uh, this before the CCIE. That the, the, the condition will be such that only few uh, players will be you know, eligible to bid. Others will be out, even if your technology is better. There are many cases of that type. But the CCI, unfortunately, has closed those cases. So-called buyer choice, which I don't agree. And this is for the dealers. Exclusivity again. Receiving order under unfair. This is a, there was a case from Maharashtra, I remember. This fellow said, I'm a, I'm a dealer of Cadbury. I'm naming the company just like that. Uh, this Just for example sake. And they said they are asking me to do something which I can't do. It's not in my power to do. I can't sell, you know, that I can't achieve the target. And they say, you're not doing enough. We are terminating all this. Thing. That's a brand case. It's a brand case. I'm not saying actually the company is involved. But the point is, excessive sale targets suppose are given. You can go to a competition lawyer. Or they are not giving you incentives. They are giving to other dealers. You are not being given sent to foreign tours, for example, though you are achieving the target. So any kind of situation, that's why I have highlighted this bullet. If people want, they, you can come to me, you can approach me, I can share you these two slides by a direct message. When should you come to, go to a competition? Okay. As I said, market operating prices or e even e-commerce e platform restricts you. There are cases. Last case is important. Last bullet, MFN clauses, white parity, as I said, make my trip. Now, if time permits, if Mr. Pava allows, I can take you very fast through the commitment bill or I stop. Sir, uh, Mr. Pava, I, tell me. Yeah, I think we'll do a separate one on the amendment bill uh, uh, because uh, there are some good uh, 15, 20 questions which have come and 
I also have so many questions which I'm dying to ask you. So I think we'll <laughs> keep your guidance over there. And... I hope I can answer your questions. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I'll Please be lenient to me. <laughs> yeah, you can, you yeah. can have a you can I would say uh, take a one minute rest. Uh, please have a please have your water. In the meantime, uh, let us do some uh, end the poll. By the way, to show you what the results were. So uh, I am ending the first poll and I am sharing the results. The question was: uh, eighty percent people are in employment and twenty uh, percent are consulting practice. And sir, eighty eight percent of the people said they have no practical experience in competition mm -hmm. laws. And twelve percent said yes. So I think uh, plus there are a lot of chat comments which are coming. Great insights, good, good presentation. So I so think what is the total number of participants? If I may ask. Yeah, yeah, no, it it, the, it crossed 90, 90, 95 at some point in time. All so right. it's a good participant. Still, we have seventy four people still sticking on. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. So uh, so what I'm saying, sir, uh, thank you for this presentation. But the presentation is not over yet. Uh, we'll do uh, you know some good practical questions have come up. Uh, plus, uh, I also have a few lot of uh, good, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, I not say good or bad that you decide, but a lot of curiosity based uh, you know, questions. Sure. So, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll just take a 30 second break. Uh, my team, my community team, if I may just, uh, uh, sir, if you can unshare the presentation for the time being. All right. Yeah. So, I'll, I, I will. I'll, I'll give a brief about Complinity, who's the organizer. Uh, Complinity is India's leading uh, compliance software. Uh, sir, you can uh, unshare. You can say stop share. No, no. Uh, you, yeah, 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 absolutely. So, uh, Complinity is India's leading compliance software, helping companies comply with the laws of the country. We cover over 2,000 laws and 25,000 compliances. And, uh, you know, companies like Max Hospital, Artemis Hospital, Panasonic, British Council, Randstad, Jai Bharat Maruti, uh, Hindware, many more companies, uh, some 700 plus legal entities and 10,000 plus uh, users all across India are using Complinity uh, to, uh, to take care of the laws and even competition laws uh, compliances are also covered in that. You can follow the YouTube channel links. By the way, many of, uh, many of you have asked whether this uh, presentation, etc., will be available. So this entire webinar will be available on the YouTube uh, with uh, Mr. Sharma's entire presentation. Uh, you can please subscribe to the YouTube channel with the links given in the chat box and uh, press double click on the bell icon uh, so that you're notified. Uh, this video plus many more sort of videos that we keep uploading and you can also follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram where we keep posting great compliance updates and stuff. Okay, uh, over to my team. Uh, if you can show a, a, a one minute sort of uh, video on... on I... Uh... Welcome to Complinity Technologies. Complinity is India's leading governance, risk and compliance software helping companies to manage their compliance, contracts, litigation, legal updates, interfinancial controls and more. Complinity is a one-stop shop for all GRC needs. With our proprietary 12 GRC modules and real-time legal updates on 2000 plus laws and 24000 plus compliances. All in an integrated platform that is easy to use with automated alerts and risk management capabilities. Is why compliance managers, general counsels and chief financial officers choose Complinity every time. Join the most innovative and prestigious brands that use Complinity. Automating your compliance management, request a demo at Complinity.com. Welcome to Complinity Technology. All right, thank you. And uh, one second. Uh, Mr. Pawa, if you permit, may I say a few words too? Yes, sir. Yes, please. If you just permit, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I'm thankful to Complinity for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I'm sure he has introduced me already, but I must uh, say something that I would, uh, I also run a blog called Antitrust and Competition Law Blog. So if you Google competition laws in India, my blog comes on the top automatically. It has been running since 2015. I was the first lawyer to start an independent blog on the subject. And this is updated blog. It comes, it's on Twitter. It's on all social platform. It is available LinkedIn also. I would request the participants to please subscribe to this blog so that they get an updated knowledge on the subject. And they can also leave their comments on the, uh, that same in the blog chat box, et cetera. And I belong to a firm called Vash Associates 
We are a 50 year old law firm. We are a corporate tax and uh, you know uh, advisory firm. Offices in Bombay, Delhi, and uh, Bangalore. And I'm heading the antitrust practice of this. Uh, we'll be happy to help anybody who wants to take uh, opinion, etc. And competition is, as I said, a very highly specialized subject. There are few people who actually understand the subject and the kind of experience. I was fortunate enough to be a part of the CCI in the beginning. That's why, and I'm also on the panel of CCI now. I'm also in panel, their counsel. I represent cases for CCI also before the High Court and NCLAT. So thank you very much, Sumiti, for giving this opportunity. No, sir. In fact, uh, I'd suggest if you can uh, give a link of your blog on the chat box so that yes, can... I can give. Yeah, I can give that. I can give Absolutely. that. That I can give. And I'll 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 take one more poll. Uh, uh, since now you know a little bit about Complinity as well. So uh, anybody would like to get a demo of Complinity, uh, uh, you know, please indicate your preference so that my team can take note of your interest and uh, also reach out to you. Uh, if you're interested uh, for about company. Okay, so I'll leave that poll open so that people can answer. So now uh, picking up the questions and answers, uh, you know, I've been really waiting for this Q&A. So Mr. Sharma, I'll do a rapid fire Q&A uh, in, in, in a random sequence. Uh, you can, uh, you may not, uh, I mean, do, you don't need to bother on the Q&A box. I'll ask you the question and then you can give a quick rapid fire answer. So sir, uh, one, one anonymous attendee asked, uh, on this link, give me a minute. Okay. Give me a minute. This is my blog. Yeah. People can note yeah. down, please. Uh, no, sir. I think uh, 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 Sanat. come. The link has come. No, link has come, but it's come only to host. Sanat, if you can post it to the to everyone, uh, sir, my team will do the needful. Uh, they'll please do that. Up. I'll be grateful. Yes, yes. So it has only come to uh, you. No, no. It has come to everyone now. Yes. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Yes, yes. Okay. So, sir, the question is, uh, uh, are the below clauses in compliance with law, like the non-complete clauses with other party and preferred customer, uh, are they in compliance with the law? No, again, it is a subjective question. Exclusivity mm -hmm. or non-compete as such is not uh, anti-competitive. People, these are normal, as I call, ancillary restraints. People have non-compete. But the point is, there are two, three conditions which you must remember. So, number one, number uh, first of all, it should be objectively justified. Why are you having a non-compete? Give me an example. Suppose you, suppose you start a new business. And if you start a new business, you will have to have dealers. And you will have to have some exclusive dealers. You will have to have promotional schemes. And to make that things happen, if you have a non-compete that you will only deal with my product and not with the product of a competitor, it is perfectly valid. But there's a big but is that it should be for a reasonable time. It cannot be for indefinite kind of a non-compete. It should be for say, three years or maximum five years. And that too, when it's an introductory offer. I give you the example. You know, Jio announced, announced that uh, free mobile when Jio entered the market. You remember? Yes. And Airtel complained against them, the famous case of Jio and Airtel. Airtel said, well, what they're doing, they're giving a free mobile phone for 500 rupees if they take their subscription and they, they, they will take all of our customer. So they are doing predatory pricing. So that, that but they, they lost. Why? Because they, CJ said it's an introductory offer. So as an introductory offer, you can give SOPs. You can even have a non-compete, you can have exclusivity also. Understand. Okay, Hitesh asks, uh, are uh, discussing um, discussing the respective purchase prices of raw materials by two OEMs with a view to achieve efficiencies allowed? No, certainly not. That is anti-competitive, that will be a cartel. Please, please don't even speak about it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. In investigations, uh, even call records can be taken. And as you were saying in the evidence, WhatsApp messages, emails, call records, everything can be sort of uh, put to uh, test. OK. Now, yes. Mr. Arwan asked, uh, even if penalty is imposed, but companies perhaps do not pay the fines, then what? What is the repercussion if companies do not pay the penalties which are imposed? Very interesting question. In fact, I should have covered that, as I said. Normally, hmm. it's a civil offense. But there is a provision in Section 42, subsection 3, which says that if you fail to pay the penalty or if you fail to comply with the orders of the commission, then you can be prosecuted also by a, before a chief at CMM Delhi. And that carries an imprisonment of three years. So there's a three year imprisonment also prescribed. Yeah, and I was also reading uh, in the act, I think they've mentioned that uh, it can be recovered as tax dues and the income tax recovery. Of course, that recovery of penalty, the way it is recoverable as a, as a land revenue, et cetera, that is there, that, that regulation they have made. Right. That is there. That is there. That is for all government use. So right. I need not say. Understand. Sir. 
Okay, uh, uh, one question from Mr. Manoj Palod. Uh, can my customer uh, force me to accept the contract condition, match the prices with my competitor and imposing market, uh, market favored nation clause, MFN clause? If my customer again? Yeah, no, it's slightly confusing on the language. Okay, I'll skip this one and I'll sort of understand and rephrase the question in my own words. Okay, moving on to the next one for the timing. Uh, in a vertical agreement, if the geography of a distributor is defined by the company giving distributorship, would it be considered anti-competitive? Mr. Rishikeshan asks. Uh, please say that again, sir. In a vertical agreement, if the mm -hmm. geography of a distributor is defined by the company giving distributorship, would it be considered anti-competitive? No, 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 not at all. See, please don't get me wrong. When I said allocated territories or allocated customers, those are hardcore kind of restrictions which are meant for uh, those agreements which have their object of restricting competition. That is, of course, a European jurisprudence. In India, we don't have that high degree of uh, knowledge or sophistication in competition laws. But in India also, vertical restraints are you know, very simple. I said the law is simple. Section 3, subsection 4 talks of vertical restraints are are presumed are not presumed to have racial adverse effect on competition, but they are prohibited only when they have AAC. AAC means appreciable adverse effect on competition when when either of the party has substantial market power. So you can allocate territories. Why not? Everybody does it, but it should not lead to foreclosure. I'll, I can further explain to this answer by saying that if you are a large player or if you are a monopoly, for example, and if you appoint a dealer, suppose there is only one dealer in say one geography, then suddenly it can cause problem to you. It depends on various factors, your structure of market, the structure of the geography we are talking about. Suppose in a remote, remote area in Andaman, you only one dealer. You refuse to appoint another dealer in Port Blair. The dealer will come to the CCI and say, why? Why are you not appointing me? There is an isolated place that you are the main only. That's how the dealers made a monopoly. Understand? So that should also not be done. So it sure. depends on various things. It's not easy. It's not, uh, sir, competition law is not black and white. It's green. Yeah. Purely green. <laughs> So as you rightly said, it is it is uh, it is half law and half economics. Uh, economics you know, it is absolutely. not be codified because we are talking business and we are talking yes. competition, and it can't be codified. Everything can't be codified. And it and the government the law is made with the with the intention that government should not interfere. Right. They made a regulator for that purpose. A regulator is an expert regulator. Right. They're highly qualified people. You see, they're highly qualified people. Most of the people are of the IRS or IAS officers, and they are now starting to take experts also. Understand. So, uh, you know, I have one query on this one uh, on the dealer, etc. When you said resale price maintenance. So, when manufacturers uh, distribute through distributors or dealers, of course, there are MRPs and MRPs are recognized by legal metrology, etc. So, uh, how do you differentiate the MRPs with the resale price maintenance? Uh, I got a very good question. I was expecting this question. So, see, MRP is something which is legally fixed. You can't sell below that, above that price. So, that's the yeah. maximum price. MRP is the maximum price. So right. dealer cannot sell more than that price. That the right. law fixes. Right. But the what the competition law seeks to restrain is the fixing the minimum price. All right. So mm. the manufacturer says that you can't sell below this minimum price. You can give only 15% discount. I give you the example of Hyundai. Mm. Hyundai was doing exactly this. And then Maruti was doing the same thing. They had employed mystery shoppers to know what discount the dealers are offering. Sure. In Goa, for example, or in Punjab, for example, yeah. these shoppers used to go and there was secret, you know, kind of email sent that the policies were distributed. So large companies often give policies, discount policy. That is anti-competitive. That is bad. You cannot. Give me one example of an email and I'll sue him. I'll take him to the CCF. There is a large company giving discount policy. You're not supposed to. You can only give a policy. You can only dis uh, fix your margin when you're giving the distributorship. This will be more. That will be that is a private agreement between you and the distributor, right? That other dealer should not know. That's what competition is. Understood. You can even compete, make the dealers compete. If dealer is good, he's selling more volume, you can give him more discount, no problem. And other dealer who's not selling good, who's not putting so much of effort, you can give him less discount, no problem. So that volume discounts are perfectly all right. But loyalty based discounts are not. You know what loyalty based discount? Grassing example. If I'm a spinner, I'm in your good books, I'll give you so much discount. But if I'm speaking against you, if I go to CCI, you will not, we will not get the goods. Stop supplies. This is what it is. Loyalty discount. Understand, sir. Similar questions are coming on similar uh, sort of subjects. So, so resale price maintenance, am I clear, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir, minimum absolutely. cannot be done. Maximum you can do. Absolutely. And, the, and another, another facet in this is very important that the, the manufacturer should not, you know, quantify the discount or the price at which the product will be resold by the dealer. 
Right. It cannot even tickle with it. It, it cannot even, you see, it, uh, make out things which can make it transparent that they are controlling. Their right. control should be invisible if at all. If at all, it has to be there. Understand. Similar questions coming from Samrudhi. She says, uh, can we stop the dealer from selling in other territories if the territories are defined in the agreement? Yes, you can. Why not? Fair, fair restriction. Right. Yeah, that is that is objectively justified, as I said. Right. But there's another, let me, I know Samrudhi, she's from a company which I know. So the point is that uh, you can stop active sales. This kind of stoppage is called active sale. There's something called passive sale, which I must tell you also. Right. What is passive sale? Passive sale is, suppose I'm a dealer for, say, Chandi Chowk in Delhi, I've got many geographical areas. Suppose a company appoints me, uh, suppose suppose Lafarge or Honsam or any cement maker appoints me a dealer in, in Chandi Chowk area, right? So I cannot sell beyond Chandni Chowk. But if suppose I get a query from, say, South Delhi on phone, and if that also is being stopped, then it is passive sale. Passive sale means unsolicited queries, requests for sale received from areas outside your geographical territory. You cannot stop that because you have not actively got. That means you are acting against the consumer. Understand. No, sir. Uh, uh, passive sale, you stop passive sale, that is not allowed. That's not. A uh, very, again, related question is, and this is my practical experience, uh, you know, one query which had come to us. Uh, again, territories were defined for the dealers and the dealer put, put up the goods on the uh, Amazon or Flipkart. You know, which which then becomes available all over India suddenly. So, what would you call this active sale, passive sale? Is it allowed, not allowed? Say? Very good question. Mm -hmm. So, this is called online sales. These yeah. are online sales. Right. So, some companies have been approaching us now with these queries that Mr. Sharma, we want to restrict our dealers only to offline sales. Right. We don't want to permit them for online sales. So, we these are again the questions which I said are again the questions of you know vertical restraints. Right. Again, the foreclosure law will apply if your restriction is such. If you are a large player, if you are a market leader, for example, and your restriction is such that the other dealers are foreclosed from approaching your product, you know, then it is not allowed. As far as online sale is concerned, online sale is actually not, it's actually kind of passive sale, you're right. It's not active sale, it's a passive sale, which cannot be stopped. So online selling generally cannot be stopped, except for the fact that when there was a case, for example, in the case of Oppo, Oppo or mobile did not, did not allow their offline sellers to sell to online because they also had their own website. So right. consumers had a choice to go to their own website and take it from there. And there was a plenty of inter-brand competition in the market, which I said there is a, it depends on inter-brand competition also. So if there are enough number of choices to the consumer, then perhaps in a situation which we has to be examined by experts, you can stop even online sales also right. for your dealers. But because there has to be the objective justification. Market. Mr. Baba, the only point is objective justification should be there. Right. Because you so know, business should have just been doing so. Of course, it like to be looked case to case because yeah, the yeah. You, everything is no answer. Can even the concept say. of territory goes. If a company has appointed say twelve territorial distributors, that you will sell only only in the territory, and all twelve all twelve start selling online and start competing. Yeah. They are competing absolutely. All, all India market uh, suddenly, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. So, everything is possible, sir, provided you have your facts clear, your intentions are valid, you are you are doing. For a business purpose, you want to increase profit, there's nothing wrong in that. Right. Okay. So, uh, are these restrictions applicable only to large companies, uh, say with thousands of crores of turnover and 50-60% market share, or they can also be applicable to a 50 crore company, uh, you know, with uh, with very uh, small scale or medium scale company and do these things apply to them as well? Very good question again. See, I as I said, this vertical restraints, three, four, are prohibited only when you have a degree of market power. So if you, it's not a question of quantum of your turnover or assets, 1000 crore, 2000 crore, doesn't matter. I'm talking of market share. So if you are a small company and if you're the only maker, suddenly you could, you'll be attracted. But if there are small companies or pl plenty of companies, you can do it because you don't have a market power. It's only related to the, the market share or market power in the market. Large companies cannot do it. Non-dominant companies can do it. Small companies and oligoplastic market can do it. There's no problem. You can do all things what you want. You can have an exclusivity. You can have absolutely whatever you want. But provided you are not a leader in the market or you are, and there are a number of players in the market. Market leaders can also do, provided it's an oligopoly. There are a number of players and there's a competitive constraint on each of them. As I gave you the example of Pepsi and Coke. So if there's a competitive constraint on you, which can be proved on facts, you can do it. Sure. Now in most of the markets, I think we see 80% of the markets are 
dominated by two three players uh, yeah. in most of the industry then and the other 20% is taken by fringe players kind of thing they are fringe fringe players you call them the economics fringe players right right right, right. okay sir uh, you also talked about abuse of dominant position and you said that uh, companies can be asked to get divided just like microsoft and other companies they can be asked to divide themselves so sir again one thing what is not clear is that suppose if uh, a, a, a giant or a company as large as microsoft or google if they are asked to divide again uh, shareholders will remain same because investments are investment ownership is ownership if a large company divides into three and they do the same thing even in three companies with the same ownership how how will really it help the competition i'll tell you you know you got a very uh, interesting question for me to answer because this has not happened it's a hypothetical question yes so division of company means what division of the businesses of the company right now i give you a, i can get an example not to be taken by name suppose reliance all of us think reliance is a big conglomerate even adani for example people take names so so if these conglomerates are dominant in any particular market as i said market is seen in the context of relevant market understand so if they are so dominant that they are, and, and again i give the example of grasim so grasim if it is only dealing in one product where it will be divided it cannot be divided but if it's a multi product company it's then it can be divided and a division will be to the extent that it stops that at the competitive conduct it creates a company a company is demerge you know is demerge the same there are two companies made out of the one company they start competing that's the meaning so investor will have no role in that if cci divides a company into two parts each company will be independent companies they may have common directors or common shareholders there's no problem but on business they will compete that was the intention of the lawyers and this what microsoft bhi yahi hua na microsoft remained under mr uh, bill gates only the ownership remained bill gates only but it stopped doing what it was doing it was not allowing the other search engine to come on board the windows 95 mm-hmm. at that time the right. you had only internet explorer you had only windows media player if you remember us time se video media pe khulta tha explorer ke alawa jata hi nahi tha sabir bhatti ko usse khareed liya hot hot mail it purchase so it became a part of internet explorer Google right. was nowhere, so that's what it happened. So I think uh, what I hear and what I understand from you, sir, is that it's not the dominance, but it's the abuse of dominance that that is yes. problem. That right. is problem. Dominant, you can be anybody. Anybody, you can be anybody. Yeah. Like for example, Google. Google is of, of course, uh, you know, Google would consume probably uh, contribute to ninety-seven, ninety-eight percent of the search market share. And if yeah. Google rules the whole world, and you know, if they start acting dominant and uh, doing anti-competitive things and not allowing certain people on their platform, etc., then that can be anti-competitive, basically. Sir, in these digital market or digital uh, players, now they are known as digital gatekeepers. Right. The term has been used in Europe called digital gatekeepers, and the in Europe at least, not in America, they are thinking of regulating them by law, not by competition law. Right. So there's a digital marketing act, digital gatekeeper act is proposed. by the european parliament which is still being debated so they will be regulated so that they cannot do what they are doing something called self referencing so what this company there is a business model which is very unique they do self referencing so if i have an agreement with google then my product will come on the top right google ke paas sara kuch control hai algorithm are there right you cannot stop it that is anti competitive that's why they were penalized in the first time right. consider the case of android os android os 90% of our phones are android based एप्पल वाले बहुत कम है ना वेरी फ्यू पीपल कैन अफोर्ड एप्पल सो 97% ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड एंड्राइड इज बीइंग यूज्ड विद Samsung व्हाटएवर सो व्हाट दे डू दे से नॉट ओनली माय ओएस यू आल्सो टेक माय प्ले स्टोर सो गूगल पूरा पैकेज कम्स टाइंग इन बंडलिंग राइट एंड देन दे डिक्टेट देयर टर्म्स एंड देन अनदर थिंग व्हिच आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट द केसेस व्हिच आर गोइंग ऑन अगेंस्ट दिस गूगल एंड सीसीआई द सेकंड केस इट वाज देयर पेनलाइज गूगल पे सो इन गूगल पे प्ले स्टोर इफ देयर आर एप्स परचेस विद इन द एप्स Then the purchaser should be given a choice to which UPI he should go. Google says no, you have to purchase only through Google Pay, and it charges a discount commission on that from the app maker. They right. are crying, thirty percent commission. What nonsense! If my purchaser wants to, if my buyer wants to purchase some product on my app, it's in app store, you know, in app, in app purchase. Yes. Then that person should be given a choice. Okay, which mode he mode he want to use? He says no, only go, go through G Pay. so these are the kind of situation which the google has been you see moment you are a large moment you are dominant the moment you have no competitive constraint you will do whatever you want to do you will devise methods to exploit you devise methods to multiply your rents it's called right. rent seeking behavior in economics it's called rent seeking behavior and the third case is going on is smart tvs 
Google's Google Android based TV, you see Google TV is there. Right. There also some conditions are unfair, discri discriminating conditions are making on uh, TV makers. We are having inquiry. We are actually, because we are involved in these cases, so I can't give you more details. Right. The fourth case, which I wrote an article about is, again, my blog, if you see, you know, the case of uh, news content. In fact, I said, is India going the Australian way? You know, in Australia, Google has been made to pay for the content of the news to the yes, news agencies. Yes. I right. did hear about that. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I wrote, I moment that thing happened, somebody, some, you know, small maverick filed a case in CCI, and the CCI also taken note of it, investigation has started. So investigation has already started against Google on the fourth account. So Google, four accounts are going on, four cases are going on, till now only two cases have been decided. Okay. Two cases are still to come. One is the Android TV, and the fourth is Google news, news content. Understood. Both investigations are on. So you might see the decisions, more penalties will come. Sure. So these are big people. These are big, and they know the law. They are. They, they are all. They have. See, they are all Americans. They know it us very well, better than us. Right. But still, they do it. Still, still, they do it. You see, the point is, when you become big, the power goes your head, sir. Yeah. So, <laughs> so talking about penalties, since you mentioned penalties, and we've seen in Competition Act, uh, the penalties are actually huge. You know, it was there in the in your slides, and what we read in the newspapers also: hundred crores, then five hundred crores, then thousand crores, etc. Ten percent of your turnover, sir. Ten percent of your average to your damn. Profits will go. So does CCI always look at it's like up to 10% of your turnover or flag 10% of the turnover CCI sort of levies the penalty? You know? Yeah, that's a very good question. So it is up to. Up to 10%. 10% is in rare cases and aggravated cases, like DLF was there. Very right. aggravated cases. Okay. Normally they go 5% to 10%, between 5 to 10%. And you're saying uh, that if the companies do not pay the penalties, then the TMPs and the directors can even be prosecuted. Uh, can be go, can go to jail also. Can go to jail also. Well, if they, if don't, they don't pay. See, another thing in, about penalty, I must tell you, now the, there is a recent you know, judgment of the Supreme Court in which they have said the penalty has to be only on relevant turnover. I just right. take a minute on that. Yeah, so yeah. your total turnover is the loss is, but if you are a multi-product company, you are a company like Reliance, you make so many things. It's not that the penalty will impose on an entire turnover, an entire group, no. The relevant turnover will be on the, on the product on which has been cartelized or which has been caught, which has been found to be violating the act. That particular right. turnover, but again, I can give the example of NSE. In NSE, the segmental reporting was not being done. So there the penalty was imposed on their entire turnover because they were not actually accounting. So ideally, it should be for conglomerates. It is always a wise thing to do segmental accounting. Yeah. For your, each of your segment, your balance sheet should be clearly showing that how much revenue is coming from one particular segment. Understand. That's yeah, the idea I can give. Competition penalties are directly linked to your turnover. So better have segmented. It should be relevant or no. Whatever now the law says it should be relevant or no. Whatever is in question will be sort of... Yes. Yeah. That is yeah. thanks to a Supreme Court judgment in Excel care. Understand. Yes. Sir, uh, in the DLF case of 2001, uh, uh, I saw that uh, in the penalty of 630 crores was levied and it was unfair terms or one-sided terms. And you also mentioned in your presentation that uh, the real estate industry said all the entire real estate industry, you know, we have seen have one-sided builder-buyer agreements. And, and why you talk of real estate? I mean, you talk of any big bank when you take home loans. So you and I both as lawyers, uh, we are in the business of sort of vetting agreements and advising clients on agreement. But when we sign our own home loan documents, uh, yeah. hardly anybody would sort of read the home loan documentation. You so, have no choice, sir. You have to if sign. We, <laughs> if we read, if we read, we cannot take the home loan, and if and we, and we can't negotiate those with, with the large bank. So, uh, so you know, across we have seen uh, people having one-sided agreements especially when one side is dominating and the other player is an individual or a small company also. So what is your, I mean, this is very rampant in the industry having one-sided uh, agreements. So how, what is your view? How does CCI look at it? Who will complain? Sir, CCI how can look into it provided people come to you. CCI has got all the powers to look into it. They, one Blair people were, you know, I said, I should say pioneering if enough to go to CCI at that time. Even now you can go if there are cases what you're telling, a complaint can go to CCI, they can examine. One-sided agreements are bad because they are they are covered they are covered under Section 42A, unfair or discriminatory. Unfair is a very broad term. Right. So unfair is captured under the law. Please use the CCI. Please come to uh, competition lawyers and file the cases. Who stops you? So is there any limitation to file the cases in CCI? No. No limitation. So if no I limitation. if I signed an unfair agreement, say five years back, seven years back. Yes, you can. You can. You can. You can. 
Okay. There's no limitation per se. There's no there's, there's no section which says that the CCI can only take for three years. No, and, nothing of that. Sort. Is it only is it only that the aggrieved party can file the complaints to CCI or a bystander or a industry watcher can also see that? Okay, this very is good question, sir. Very good question. In fact, I should have said about it in the beginning. I'm sorry, I missed it. So, an aggrieved and comp uh, complaint is not called complaint. It's called information. In right. CCI, because when I was the CCI, the act was amended, 2007. This is sort of my contribution, you can say. We use the word information at that time. So information can be filed by anybody. You can be a bystander, you can be even a good Samaritan. Right. You can be a good lawyer who's, who wants to improve the system. He can go to CCI. So I have no stakes in this. And in fact, to tell you the truth, if you see the Google orders, most of the cases have been filed by lawyers. Right. I'm a Google user. I'm a user of internet. And so look, thousands of crores of penalties have issued. Right. So anybody can file. You may not have a stake. You may not be a victim at all. That is the beauty of this uh, of this law. But if the, if the, if somebody is a bystander or not a victim and he files the information and he doesn't need to sort of come and hire lawyers and represent himself and absolutely, it's like consumer. It's like consumer protection act. You can right. file your own case. There right. are cases. There are there are there are, there are ex servicemen. I've seen the major general, major etc. Who have actually fought their own cases in CCI. Right. Sir, what would be, since there are certain uh, portion of the audience which is practicing fraternity also, what would be your advice to the practicing fraternity? How can they develop this competition law practice? And uh, how would, uh, you know, what are the areas where they can sort of, uh, uh, you know, have this as a practice area? Sir, competition is a very niche area. It's a specialized, as I say. If you have understanding of economics, please go into it. Otherwise, you will become like another lawyer or another male. male. Please, pardon me saying. So you have to first develop your understanding of the subject of markets. You must carefully, you must read the newspaper daily. You must read the CCI website. You must see the orders. They say, go through them in detail. People, most of the people don't read the orders and even at least read my blog, if nothing else. My blog is self, I give it for the reason to, to increase knowledge of the public. The sure. blog is for the public, for the students to read, for the lawyers to read. Please read this. I realize that. So the point is, not I'm not, not only my blog, you read anywhere. Whenever the literature comes, please read about it. And if you find it interesting, if you find you have the neck for it, then go for it. Just don't go for it. See, there is money in it. Money is every in the all practice areas. But the point is, it is highly specialized. You will not be able to go longer if you don't have a real understanding of the law or little economics of law. Absolutely. So you should be at least an economic uh, knowledge, uh, knowing, knowing lawyer, in my view, would do better than a non-economics knowing lawyer. Understand. And sir, on the employment side, there would be some general counsels, CFOs, CEOs, etc. attending the webinar today. What would be there, you know, if you have to give, give them two or three advice of how, you know, what kind of safeguards they should build uh, in, in conducting their uh, uh, legal or, or business. So what, what would be your advice? Sir, my advice to the general counsels or the CFOs or the general managers, legal heads or in-house, legal, all in-house legal attending this program would be three. Number one, Please take competition law seriously. Please, it is not your take off like the, you know, Article 14 under the Companies Act compliance are done. It's not that compliance. So please consider the competition compliance audit for your company or for your group. You must have an audit done. If you're not done already, you may be on the wrong side of law without knowing. It may happen that sometimes somebody makes a complaint not known to you, or it could be, it could be even a, you know, it could be even a, a whistleblower, there are cases which cartels have been busted by whistleblowers for foreign companies, secreted because we are involved, so we can't discuss the details. And then the companies are caught napping. Please do your audit thoroughly and by experts. And thirdly, if you are a company which has a large market share, you are vulnerable. Please understand, you are more vulnerable. If any of if any of the general uh, in-house legal who are attending this conference, this is a webinar today, belong to companies who are large companies, large by the says more than 30% market share is there, they have to be more cautious. Understood. And then please conduct your in-house trainings of your salespeople, people who actually deal with competitors. And also please be in touch with those of your corporate affairs people who stay close to the associations, you know, or corporate communication managers who are in touch with the trade associations. Because that, that is where the problem can come. So these are some of the tips. And of course, please read the law. Please read the website. I, all I can say is please be informed. Please be in touch with uh, literature available on the subject, including my blog. Sure. Sir, a couple of questions have come up on the combinations. Uh, and we are going slightly... Sir, now we are to, to 144. 
Yeah, yeah. So now we'll, we'll wrap up for the next two minutes. Just, I think, one last question. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, please. Uh, on combination, there are three, four questions which have been asked on combinations. So, Give me a minute. Uh, I'll just take a drop. Yes, yes, sir. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, Holsim and, uh, uh, and Ambuja Cement, uh, Gujarat Ambuja Cement uh, merger was there. Then Z and Sony merger have also been there. And recently, we heard about Air India and Vestara also sort of uh, proposing to merge, etc. So the question, the, I am consolidating all these questions so that, you know, in the interest of time, what does CCI look at when such large players merge? And anyway, see, airlines is a consolidated industry and so are so <laughs> yeah, media entertainment, etc. So when such large mergers happen, of course, there will be uh, more dominance created and with more dominance and with more power also comes the uh, potential of more abuse. So how does CCI look at, you said, CCI has approved 97% of all the combination cases which have come. So what do they look at? What are the key considerations? How do how can they uh, see in advance that whether the abuse will happen or not happen, et cetera, et cetera? Very good. Very good question, sir. <laughs> this is the most relevant question which should have come on this subject. So what is, so first of all, let me take you a little context. So section three and four are actually prohibited. Section three is uh, anti-competitive agreements are prohibited. Section 4 is abuse of dominant position is prohibited. But Section 6 is combinations. Combination means merger and acquisition. They are regulated. So see the, the, the legislative difference in between the two kind of conduct. So mergers and acquisitions are only regulated. They're not prohibited, number one. Why? And why they need to be regulated is because, and this is an ex ante regulation. In mergers and acquisition, as you rightly said, CC has to foresee that what will happen in future if we allow this merger, right? So what they look into it is this. There is an economist called unilateral effects. So the possibility of, suppose there are two companies today, and if they budge, obviously they'll have a tendency to increase prices because they'll have no competition left. So the moment a merger, which is a horizontal merger, the large merger you talked about are all horizontal mergers. Horizontal mergers mean when they are the same product line, they're making the same product, including the airline merger, which you said. They're all horizontal mergers. So these are always, you know, they require form two filing. There are two kinds of forms which are filed in CCI. Form one and form two. Form one is simple. Form two is complex forms which there are highly sophisticated economic analysis goes into them. And what the CCI looks actually is, I'll tell you the nutshell is, okay, after the merger, whether they'll become dominant, whether there is it a possibility of becoming dominant. So if it will happen like this, that there will be only one pair left, they will never approve the merger. Right. They will never approve the merger. They'll deny the merger. But Suppose an oligopoly will remain, and in an oligopoly of say four or five players, suppose these two will suppose the joint will control sixty percent of the markets. Then what they ask these these people to do is to divest in the overlapping areas, in the jurisdiction. Suppose cement merger over. Suppose Holsam and Lafarge are present not all in India, but in say West India they are hugely present. There are number of dealers. So they go to the dealership. Kitne aapke, kitne aapke distributors hai. In every geography they see, they ask so many questions. And then they will say, you find out a buyer in West India. We will not allow the merger in West India to happen. Oh. So you find out a buyer. So they will ask the uh, these two companies, I'm just giving a hypothetical example, to divest the West Indian business. Understood? So divestors are given. You know, remedies in the form of remedies are given. This is the, this happens all over the world. Bayer and Monsanto merge, by the world's largest companies. Why are you forgetting Bayer and Monsanto? I wrote an article. People don't read my article, that is unfortunate, but I wrote an article in the Economic Times. They created a Besento. Why should CCI look at, stop uh, this merger? I wrote when this merger was being considered. I'm talking of 2018, 17. But the point is unilateral effect. So buyer Besento now, we are only three companies in the world who control the entire food chain of the world, the entire genomes, you know, the entire uh, pedigrees of the rice and wheat, which is crop for the third world countries. But they did not, but for the CCI must have looked into it and they gave the remedies. So modifications are provided and the remedies, they take care that wherever there are overlaps, for them, they have to fight buyers. Linda Prexer, see the case of Linda Prexer, same thing happened. They had to buy, find an independent buyer in Chennai. Right. So, right. so this is the answer I've been trying to give. Understand. So, no, so I... CCI takes care of all this. They know what they're doing. Unilateral right. effects have to be prevented. Understand. So that they should not have an ability to raise price later on. I think with this, uh, we can end the, uh, end the webinar. So Mr. Sharma, really, really deep sense of gratitude. Thank you very much for 
coming and lighting and it was a wonderful presentation not only your presentation but also uh, i think for the last half an hour or more uh, you've been answering rapid fire questions from the audience and some of them from myself as well so i think it's been wonderful uh, mr i hope i've been able to satisfy some of you <laughs> no no absolutely um, uh, uh, there is no end to satisfaction but uh, you know the wanna dil mange more i think uh, we'll we'll again have you with the when the amendment act when the bill sort of is becoming an act or something uh, we'll again would like to invite you later and uh, sir thank you and, and special thanks you since uh, you are in pain and, uh, and despite that your personal difficulty you are here missing your hearings really really thank you very much wonderful presentation mr sharma and thank you audience for uh, coming in large numbers and staying put we will be uploading the copy of this webinar on the youtube channels and the links will be shared with everybody everyone thank you thank very you much sumit pawar thanks to community i hope i can be shared the feedback about the participants if there is any Sure, sir. Sure. Please share. No, the feedback is only good, better, and best only. So uh, you know. So <laughs> sure, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Very thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Subhijit. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Complinity. Thank you, audience. Welcome to Complinity Technologies. Complinity is India's leading governance, risk, and compliance software helping companies to manage their compliance, contracts, litigation, legal updates. interfinancial controls and more complinity is a one stop shop for all grc needs with our proprietary 12 grc modules and real time legal updates on 2000 plus laws and 24000 plus compliances all in an integrated platform that is easy to use with automated alerts and risk management capabilities is why compliance managers general counsels and chief financial officers choose complinity every time Join the most innovative and prestigious brands that use Complinity. Automating your compliance management. Request a demo at complinity.com.